Aram does the low voice for God's Fall, and since this podcast began, he will immediately do God's Fall voice, overshoot normal tone, and then settle in to kill every monster. But I will also over My name correct is Aram. My name's Aram. My name's Aram. <laughs> so I got my name's Aram. <laughs> there you go. That's it. My name is Aram, and my pronouns are he, him. I'm the writer and producer of the Dungeon & Dragons podcast, God's Fall. My name's Dylan. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a physicist from Canada. Welcome to Kill Kill Every every monster. Monster. This week on Kill Every Monster, we are featuring the Displacer Beast. The Monster Manual describes the Displacer Beast as a monstrous predator that takes its name from its ability to displace light so it appears to be several feet away from its actual location. The Displacer Beast resembles a sleek, great cat covered in blue-black fur. However, its otherworldly origins are clear in its six legs and two tentacles sprouting from its shoulders both ending in pads tipped with spiky protrusions. The Displacer Beast's eyes glow with an awful malevolence that persists even in death. We are joined by Neil Powell. Neil, whose pronouns are he, him, is a content creator and podcaster that has rambled on about TTRPGs for years on both the Dungeon Masters block and DMnastics. He is one mind behind Quantum Ogre Publishing that brought to life the ultimate guide to hair, which you can find on Drive Through RPG. He can sometimes be found on Twitter at Jote Moniak. Welcome to the show, Neil. Thank you. I am I am excited. So much of the work of this podcast is not on me, and I, I couldn't be happier. <laughs> Isn't it nice just to have a break where you can show up and do nothing? Neil, tell me what is a displacer beast to you? I think having been a listener to your podcast, I think one of the best terms to come up with and it fits for most of the things that are discussed is a missed opportunity. Yes. As someone who's who's played for a really long time, the Displacer Beast, I guess for me, is the third edition Displacer Beast. Like that's that's my touch point. That's where my brain goes. And so as prep, I read the fifth edition one and I checked to see if I had missed something or if someone had deleted a vast portion of what should be in this stat block with an IP that is wholly tied to Dungeons and Dragons in the same way that the Mind Flayer and the Beholder is. This is one of the iconic monsters and I'm just baffled at what 5th edition has presented. It just doesn't feel as powerful as it should be. It feels a lot in the way how they nerfed the werewolf in order for it to like, if you know a player is cursed with lycanthropy, they become crazy more powerful and they just get a whole party of werewolves because why not? They, for some reason, they have weakened this character a bit and, it's, and it is a bummer. This is the thing though, is I'm not that concerned about the power level on it. Where the missed opportunity lives is it glosses over the intelligence constantly like it's it's featured pretty heavily in the description but it tends to get put in in place of just a particularly clever leopard it's not quite full-blown humanoid intelligence but this isn't a wild animal anymore no this is something that enjoys being mean it takes pleasure in it we talked about this with uh sean in the rock episode they're like predatory birds that will tackle a creature and start eating before it's dead but that's because If you are an animal, you don't have the understanding of mercy. You're just like, well, now now that I have the meat I'm going to eat, I'm going to start eating it. This is a thing that will do that exact same thing, but it'll do it in the hopes that you will scream while it's eating you. Yeah, maybe I'll just start chewing on a foot and I'll slowly work my way up, that kind of thing. And when you have something that is kind of give away the game for part two, that absolutely monstrous, you can do some really cool shit with that in a story. A lot of it goes back to the original story that that prompted it all. And listening to that, that thing is terrifying. The version I looked at was the very first short story that became a book that became a second book, but it's called The Black Destroyer, and it is the coral that this is all based off of. And it is just basically the only sentient creature left on a planet. 
it is hunted to extinction all sentient life on this planet when a ship arrives. And then it basically has to go through the mental exercise of, okay, I can't kill everyone because if I start doing that, then the rest of them will find out. So how can I, how can I effectively slowly kill and eventually kill everyone? There are some times where you hear a sci-fi story and you like have to either actually fully read it or like sort of piece together what the analogy is. Hearing someone talk about, yeah, and then the story was directly just about overconsumption, 100% stated on the page. Yeah. How do you possibly consume all the things you could want to consume without destroying the world and leaving it a barren wasteland? And it's hard to do that when you really hate everything. Can I figure this out? Can I also figure this out and then use their ship to fly back to what is quoted as an unlimited supply? That's the other thing with a displacer beast. It feels like an alien. Like once they get out, assuming they breed, and I'm assuming that they do because they had a whole planet of them, like they're not just born things out of the mist or something. One of the straight up fifth edition monster manual description, it references breeding displacer beasts, so they do make baby displacer beasts. Two, in the wild beyond the witch light, there is a stat block for the displacer beast kitten. Yeah. Yeah. Aram, you can just look at that later. I'm not going to send you the link for that because we need to record a fucking episode. I'll be distracted for 10 minutes. Yep. <laughs> but it exists. It's small. It's cute. There's. I have questions about the fact that it begins as unaligned because that starts putting in like... It starts as unaligned and then learns to be evil? I guess that's better than being born evil. When you are an extra planar creature, there is the possibility that you're talking about something that is not... That is at most semi-biological. Like when we talk about angels and devils, like this is a thing out of the Feywild. It is partially like a manifest intention or desire or something like that. Yeah, it could be born with a little hate in it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it is born manifested around the idea of hate and consumption. What baby isn't? (laughs) It is not biologically evil because it isn't biological. Right. It functions like something biological because the Feywild is an exaggeration of forests, but it also isn't nature. The Feywild isn't natural. That to me would just seem like it would overwhelm very quickly. Yeah. Any area it ended up in, it would overpopulate incredibly fast and it would be a scourge within a decade. God, if only there was a second monster somewhere in the manual that was specifically tasked with hunting them to prevent (laughs) that from occurring. God, one of the, again, only times D&D has invoked ecology or something like that. Yeah, it's again one of the one of the good ways they've done it. It's kind of interesting. For whatever reason, Blink Dogs and Displacer Beasts have been at odds for for always um some of the earliest art is a pack of blink dogs and that's the other thing is like the disparity between their difficulty is usually multiple blink dogs one displacer beast yeah like dolphins and an orca or you could just tone it down to the real world equivalents a panther and a pack of wild dogs but dolphins are real blink dogs aren't even wolves they're just they're fey wild dogs and then some of the early stuff it also was the idea that the blinking and the displacing are at some existential odds as to how they both interact so like they just in some ways they disrupt each other to the point of just perpetually pissing each other off i don't and like and to the point where like if a displacer beast were to displace a blink dock would be like hey damn it hey hey i know what's over there they don't like their vibe yeah. Yeah, they just hate each other's vibe. They give off vibrations. It's weird. I don't like your energy. You don't like my energy. Like in the fifth edition explanation, it's the displacer beasts were bred in the Fey Wild by the unseely courts of the Fey, and the Seely are the ones that had the blink dogs. And you're just like, no, these are legitimately, again, imbued by Fey magic and at base at odds. Why do they hate each other? Because they were made by people who hated each other and they can smell it. And they were genetically and magically changed to hate each other. So it does make sense. However, that said, the idea that they were trained and then fight and then got loose and now they're here. I like that less than I like the idea of the Blink Dogs already being here. 
and they were cool and we knew who they were and they're hard to capture, but once in a while you can befriend one and then the displacer bees show up and the blink dogs rally to defend their home. That's just a more fun story to me than somehow they both got through the veil. Well, and then you also have the the super fun historical of like the blink dog is is always lawful good and the displacer beast is always chaotic evil. That's just a guy who hates cats. That's all that is. Yeah. She's like, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure they are because it's a dog and a cat, but okay. This is one of the only times where I'll, I'll defend this because like the lawful bit of it is like the dog stereotype loyal. Sure. But the cats are evil. The big cats are scary. They're terrifying. I've probably talked about it before, like on air about being like at a zoo and hearing a lion roar 20 feet away. It hits you in the hindbrain. Yeah. They are a scary creature. And then they stalk. They move so quietly and they can move through trees. Make that an enemy. Of course, make that evil. That is so cool. Having an evil dog is immediately less interesting to me because at the end of the day, dogs like a wolf is still very quiet. They're still very sneaky, but with the pack and like there's a whole lot of stuff where I'm just like, this doesn't worry me in the same sort of hindbrain twinge that the panther with tentacles stalking me in the night because it hates the idea that I haven't died yet. That's great. I love cats. I love my cat. And this is a time where they're like, no, cat dog dichotomy, cat evil dog good. I'm like, yes, good. And I think that hits on like the most important lack of playing into that intelligence piece, because even if we're not going to play into like the existential, I shouldn't kill everyone right now. I should kill them slowly so that I can kill more. I don't even feel like the intelligence gets used enough to create the fear that you're implying. It's not, you. it's just like, ha, I'm here. And it, it, the idea is, yeah, that would never happen. It's going to wait and then murder the person who's wearing a dress in the back and just robes and go that direction. It's going to stalk you, wait until you break camp and then take out the watch first. It's clever enough. It sees the wizard. Yep, it knows. And they would remember. Like, these monsters are smart enough to remember. So if they get into a fight with a wizard, they're like, okay, I know what that is. And then they're going to use tactics and they would adapt because they're smart enough to do that. This is one of the monsters where it actually hits me the opposite way of, like, we had this conversation about the troll being a monster that works as, like, a random encounter or a mook or, like, I want I want the Displacer Beast to be mooks. I want it to be specifically under something so that the players are set up to underestimate it. When the villain snaps his fingers and the pack of Displacer Beast is suddenly on the rooftop surrounding them, and he looks over and tells one of them, just kill them. And it looks over and growls and smiles and turns back and makes eye contact with the wizard. And then they, they've got language, right? They can speak. They can speak, right? I believe. Uh, no, they don't have a language. That's unfortunate. That got taken but away. But even then, that still works where you're like making direct eye contact with the wizard and then it just smiles. And the players suddenly get the moment of like, oh, that is that is not an animal. They used to have a language, right? So not only was it taken away, the one that was taken away from third edition was common. Not only can that smile happen, but they can turn and say whatever terrifying thing comes to mind. Oh, that'll be fun. And like, why can't you talk to them? Why would they take that specific thing away? Especially because, again, the scariest thing about them is the fact that they are a six intelligence. The rule of thumb for D&D has always been the baseline sapience, and this is, again, a place where D&D has put its foot somewhere it shouldn't have, but playing in their field. Three is the threshold for sapience. If you roll as low as you possibly can for human intelligence, you know, 4d6 drop the lowest and you still manage to get a three. You can talk, you can learn to read, you just won't know that much. All your knowledge seals are gonna be in one ear out the other. Right. This thing has an intelligence of six, not as clever as the average human, but smart enough to learn, smart enough that it can speak, it could read. This thing could drive. It could absolutely drive. It is a smart thing that should be able to talk and communicate and make plans and loyalties right. and associations, all of that it should be able to do at an intelligence of six.
the placement of uh, Displacer Beast's sort of intelligence is always just interesting to me because they're not quite clever enough to be an arc villain. They're they're clever enough to like either be the thing that's going on for a session or to be the hyenas from Lion King. They've got tactics, not so much a plan. They can add so much more to a campaign in that way. These things cannot be reasoned with. They specifically want to kill you, and the deal was, I'll let you kill them. And now they're on villain side. That's it. The second you start negotiating, all it's going to see is weakness. <laughs> yeah, you're just telling it what it wants to hear. All oh, those things you value, outstanding. I will destroy them first. But if it doesn't pan out and I, I don't get the opportunity, I totally understand. And maybe I just won't go that direction. But maybe I will. I do really like that acknowledgement of like lack of understanding absolving morality where it's maybe it's just like the displacer beast doesn't quite have the high enough concept to conceive of your life as valuable so at that point not valuing your life is not immoral it's incompetent you know just hasn't learned the inherent ability of any sort of empathy i need that to survive so i'm gonna get that eventually you and i and somewhat dylan need empathy right no i don't <laughs> cowards this creature came from a world that probably empathy cost the people who were there. The reason why they don't exist anymore is because they had empathy. The only creatures left are the ones who have no empathy. Well, that's in the initial book there. In the, in the fifth edition explanation, they started off as mean. Like they were kind of cruel predators. And then they were captured by the mean fae and trained to be meaner. Like at that point, like you've just... You've had something that might even have that little bit of conservationist bent where it knows that I can't slaughter everything in existence because then what will I eat? And just push it up to, no, you could. An evil person can make something neutral evil. Like there are a lot of things that just exist in our world that wholly unto themselves are, are nothing one way or the other, but bad evil evil air quote people can easily make them evil and so i kind of see that with the displacer beast is under all the right circumstances that's not true if the right party gets a displacer beast kitten then it's just something that is with them it is a trusted party member it is it is valued it is cared for there's probably going to be some issues early on you got to be a no no put it down put down that goblin otherwise than that you're probably going to be okay if you talk to people, particularly this happens a lot with dog people. I grew up around dogs. I love dogs. Don't get me wrong. But there are a lot of people where it's like they grew up with a German shepherd that was well trained. And then they think little dogs are shitty and cats are shitty. But that's because if you don't train a German shepherd, it'll murder you. If you don't train a cat, it'll be an asshole. So you wind up with a lot of mean cats that just never have any sort of training. To be fair, if you train a cat, it'll still be an asshole. <laughs> but it's a trained asshole. Right, but the little Jack Russell Terrier, because it can't kill you. Yeah, the little yappy dog that's barking and doing the Napoleon complex thing, it's because they looked at it and were like, this thing is too small to be a threat. I don't need to train this out of it. Right, I can lift it up, carry it outside. What do I need to train it for? And this is just the case of what if a Jack Russell Terrier was, you know, five feet tall, had spiky tentacles and could tear your throat out. Mm -hmm. and we just never trained them. We'd all die. Bad pet owners make bad pets. Exactly. <laughs> it turns out that the unseelie court is a very bad pet owner. Is the displacer beast a monster? Absolutely. It is literally just figuring out what kind of monster you want it to be. We stumbled onto a fun game at the end of season one where we got to play Does It Murder? Because, honestly, no level of monstrosity necessarily implies whether it will kill you when you're helpless. This is the first creature to short-circuit that game entirely and having a subheading, just desire to kill. I think we had zombies that, like, the most killy. Like, the second you go down, they'll ignore everything and just kill you. But this thing enjoys it. So that does take it one step further. Yeah. This is the new maximum murder. <laughs> Absolutely. What am I flavoring to either make them scarier um, just in the way that they are presented or am I making them scarier in like the actual stat block and what the players are going to need to do to defeat this monster? I do like the idea of them hunting in packs. 
I think a lot of DMs use them as singular creatures, but the idea of them being a pack is then you can introduce like this one's personality is a little different than this one. So you immediately get the idea that they're individual creatures by meeting them together because they seem distinctive. I think that's a three step arc though, right? Because like if I'm running this game long term, these are a challenge three monster. And honestly, that still feels kind of low balling it because it's like way low 13 AC, but it's got the displacer beast thing where it's harder to hit. It's got 85 hit points. It's doing like on a hit 2d6 plus four damage like this will fucking shred characters if it really wants to. And that's 2d6 plus four on a multi attack. So potentially up to four die six plus eight. If you send this creature after four third level players, someone is going down if you if you have played them and right, depending on how you run it someone is going to die yeah which is great if you use their tactics where you have one hit them and then drag them off into an ambush which is exactly what they should do neil you mentioned this earlier don't just have them show up like aha and then there's a you no know, they need to stalk and hide if there's three of them one of them needs to do a little hit maybe some gorilla tactics wear you down you play the party against them against itself you let them know that there is a displacer beast in the area and then you just let the displacer beast convince them that there is one displacer beast in the area it's not until like one of them hits 45 hit points and then suddenly two more come out of the bushes and they go like oh motherfucker the idea of somehow convincing the actions of one player character to affect another is exactly it would be my 100 yeah. percent goal in this is like you cast fireball onto your own party because you thought it was the displacer beast i have done my job end of session i'm going home so you all can think about what just happened <laughs> <laughs> How would you change the fifth edition Displacer Beast? Step one is answering what role is this trying to fill for you? One, they can either bare minimum understand, if not speak. Two, you've got too many legs not to scratch the hell out of somebody. Additionally, why can't they climb? Yeah, why don't they have a climb speed? Apparently someone's never seen a cat, any cat <laughs> yeah. ever before. This is my only assumption because they should absolutely have a climb speed. This was one of the things Aram and I were talking about when we were we were planning sort of like we started throwing around ideas of how are we going to do the uh, the AP for this episode. And one of the things we were talking about is like the displacer beast running through treetops and getting people with the tentacles from above is so terrifying and also so cat like. It's a 10 foot reach. You're telling me this cat doesn't sit on a large branch, wait for you to pass under and thwack you with one and drag you up and murder you. Come on. Of course they do. Picture that standard like leopard in a tree out in the Serengeti, except in like an old oak. Deer runs past suckers on either side of the thing's head. Just grab it and yank. Well, the other thing that, that I find odd is the lack of what's telling me it's stealthy. I feel like you've looked too much at the idea that it can displace, but it's also really quiet. Even if it didn't have an ounce of displacement, it should be able to sneak up on the party. Regardless, the displacement is only a bonus when it does need to physically confront something that is less likely to be hit. Interestingly, the displacement is also in no way a stealth effect. Right. Yeah. It makes itself still visible but three feet to the left. So like the party is just wrong about where it is. It's actually maybe easier to find if it constantly has this blurring effect bouncing around. So you got to make sure like this thing has a stealth bonus. This should have advantage on stealth rolls. This should have proficiency in stealth. Any cat should have a set amount of abilities and it should have bonuses on when it sees things and pounces on things and hears things. It also There's doesn't have like the standard advantage on like uh no on perception no nothing the only explanation for me is that they were like look we need to cut back on a stat block for editing and they were like fuck it got the displacer beast it's the only thing that makes sense to me because why do this otherwise your cr one quarter panther has both keen spell and a pounce ability even if you want to leave the displacer beast as it is aside from add at least understands if not can speak common uh, then you do the pack lord that way is like giving it the pounce 
so that it's like, okay, this thing is, if it's got a 10 foot run up, is going to make claw attacks. They're going to be weaker and they won't have the double type of damage, but it'll tackle you to the ground. If you fail the strength save, it's going to get a bite attack off. And then it's immediate response after that is bounce back a little bit so that you are 10 feet away. And then it's just going to keep you back with the tentacles. I agree with the way the stat block is built. If you're fighting a displacer beast, unless it can make like a third attack, you know, unless you add a grapple effect to the tentacles so it can pull you in and get a bite off or something like that, which it should have. Yep. I don't, I don't disagree with you. Unless you're pulling stuff like that, it is going to fight almost entirely with those tentacles. Which makes it so boring. It's so boring because you know exactly what it's going to do. You don't have options. It, the players are going to anticipate everything the creature does because it doesn't have options. But the options there become approach-based, right? Like, yeah, it's going to attack with the tentacles in the same way that the fighter is going to attack with the sword. But if it's got a 10-foot reach and it's constantly making sure that it's 10 feet back then when the fighter approaches, it's going to make attacks of opportunity or it's going to get up into the trees and attack down because it's got enough reach to do that. The only reason to add the claws and stuff is for things like the pounce attack where you have something very situational and once you got into the flow of combat, pounce attacks don't go off aside from as an intro move, typically. I assume, like Aram, you mentioned, like fitting into a certain stat block, a certain framing of it needs to stay CR3, but like I wouldn't have done displacement that way. You want to tell me, one, it's disadvantage, which is not a 50-50 shot. That's way less than that. Additionally, if it gets hit, which I don't know, that's kind of the game we're playing here, then it goes away. I'm like, well, then it's just a tentacle panther. That's it. Because, of course, I hit it. I that's what I'm trying to do. And now it doesn't do the one thing that like, it's really, it's, it's in the, it's in its literal name. It can't do that now because we're all hitting it. I like it much better. Like, yeah. Okay. If you get a hit off, it stops vibrating, but only until you get to finish your additional attacks, then it is immediately vibrating by the time the next person gets to it. Cause otherwise it does like, it's already pretty nerfed. And with that, once a party understands what's happening, they just have, they just all hold their action until the best guy with a hit gets the hit off and then they can all attack it as normal. Even if you're worried about making it stuff to track and making it harder, because you're right, a disadvantage depending on your attack. But that's always my, my annoyance with certain disadvantage effects is they don't impact players quite linearly. If you have a low bonus, disadvantage actually hurts you so much more than the equivalent plus whatever bonus. So just give it a higher AC and have in the stat block, this is reflecting the fact that it is constantly projecting illusions. If you cast Dispel Magic on the Displacer Beast, this effect is dis is suppressed for one minute, something like that. And then you have the same ability where the players get to feel clever. The wizard gets to do something that isn't just casting fireball that makes them feel like a smart person. Right. Uh, and then you can get the fighter in to do... It opens up a better combat narrative than just if, if we hit it, then we'll be able to hit it more. If, if there was any one thing that I would change, if like, you know, let's say I can change one and I cannot change anything else, that's the one. Hitting it does not disrupt the displacement. It is literally its name. It is the, it is the shtick. It's the thing. No, it does not break it. Aram, tell me about your first big hunt. Give me a good Kenku name. Polly. Polly? Perfect. <laughs> the worst part is I was expecting you to be disappointed in me. That was an Aram answer. And then I realized <laughs> I was giving it to Aram, and I see where my mistake was. Yes, I am Polly the Kenku. Okay, so. Little bag of crackers. Mandatory. I am playing Polly the Kenku Hunter. Polly comes from a small village. Uh, on like a coastal a cliff, tall trees that kind of grow out and over the edge of the cliff because the wind comes rolling down 
and over the edge of this cliff and it's kind of pushed all the trees out. So they live kind of at the, at the top here and they'll spend a lot of time in this area here. Most of the Kenku don't go far from home. But Polly was always curious about things, always out in places she shouldn't be, always messing with bugs and creatures she shouldn't, always adopting things she shouldn't and bringing them home. And she just always had a, a desire to travel and learn. And eventually that got to the point where she had to like take care of herself. So she learned how to survive and she learned how to hunt and she picked some things up from her uncles. She's one of those kids where she got to be 16, 17 equivalent in human years, right? And she looked around and was like, I love these people. This has been a great life, but there's nothing for me here. And I have to leave because I just can't do the same thing any longer. And so she took off. And she found out that using all those skills she had acquired led to a lucrative career taking care of dangerous creatures that towns can't handle. Because that's the sort of job where you can like chase wolves out of town, giant rats out of a tavern basement, all that stuff. But there's got to be a point where Polly got a name for herself. We had something very bad happen in the village. A creature ended up here that shouldn't be here. We're not, we're not even exactly sure where it came from or how it got here. An intellect devourer started to mess with things in town and no one knew what was happening. No one could understand what was happening. No one had, had ever seen what or could even comprehend what they were doing. But I could. evidence of where it had been, where it had been burrowing, where it had been hiding. And despite not knowing what the hell the thing was, I was able to track it down and kill it. And right then I learned my value and what I could bring to the world. I can defend and decipher and Sherlock Holmes things that other people can't, and I can remove threats from the world. I felt really good about that. And I've been doing it ever since. You operate a lot off of tracks and evidence. So let's talk about the tracks and evidence. Neil, you got any idea how you got here? Or was this sort of a uh, fall between the planes story? That's a wonderful question. I had been thinking about that question the whole time before you had asked it. For the record, our, our two glaring holes for holes in reality would be uh, near the hag or near uh, just references to an old elven city and a black dragon would be the two things to pull out, forced out by an apex predator, if you do not have an answer of your own already. I think things had just gotten old for this displacer beast. Things had gotten normal. Things had gotten just boring. It's the flaw with intelligent creatures. If they're smart enough to have like a good fear response, they're smart enough to eventually get scared and leave the hunting ground. Once they felt this tear be between the realms, they sought it out because I don't know if it was known what that tear could possibly be other than it's going to lead to somewhere else. And then they stepped through. and basically have been hunting the the material world ever since because this is way more fun than having to deal with anything in the Feywild. Oh, the Feywild? The Feywild's dangerous. Here, yeah. here, you're dangerous. The odds of finding a predator that could even hold a candle. I also really love the idea that we're both here because we got a little bored. So, tell me then, what have you been up to as of late? Why was Polly hired? It took a while to find footing because the rules changed. 
all of the rules changed in a very, from my perspective, an amazing way that the rule people follow the rules in a very understandable way. So eventually finding a town that was farther away from most groups of people. Um, don't get me wrong. I, I would just as soon stay near a larger town, but the risks, the risk isn't worth the reward. So living out on the edge has been much more beneficial. And as of late, it, it appears that people care more for the animals that they have than just about anything else. Um, so rather than attacking those animals outright, because again, that's, that's not as much fun. Often they keep them caged, which is beyond my understanding, but I have started to take them because then they follow and then I can hunt people instead. So in this town, there is, there were stories building up of disappearances, right? Just enough to play into Polly's ego a little. These are the sorts of things that you think of as your responsibility to handle. No one else can sort these things out. I care about the question more than the, than the people. Right. Like he does like, I'm not soulless, right? Like people, whatever, but really like, I care about the mystery. I don't care about the people. Helping people is bonus points. Yeah. Not valueless. It's good. You you recognize that. But also, the fact that I can help people doing the thing that I wanted to do anyway. I'll forget about the people. Yeah. I'll forget about them the second the gold hits my hand, but I'll remember the creature. The bits that hit your ear, your sound hole. I don't know how birds ear work. Hole. <laughs> yeah. Ear hole. Birds are weird. When a wolf attacks in the middle of the night, you know, goes after a sheep farm. It kills the sheep and drags the corpse away. But these stories don't involve the right amount of blood. Right? There is not a slaughter on the farmyard and meat dragged away. There is a sheep stolen. Yeah, these are clean kills. But what really sold it was exactly what Neil said. Eventually, when the problem was like noticeable, after this had happened enough times for the farmers to get together and realize, oh, there's a predator, the farmers started disappearing. Search parties would go out and some of them would come back. It was never a massacre. They never saw what happened, but they would not all come back. Someone always dies. But you're different, right? They didn't expect a Kenku to show up. So tell me, what is the gesture? What's the thing that made it clear to them that you are an adventurer? I'm well geared. I have armor that is clearly magic. My bow is clearly magic. My cloak is clearly elven made and just a beautiful weave. I look a little expensive compared to everyone else. I've got that adventurer look to me. There's the conversation, people get together. Uh, the town has to round up money to be able to fund this. In the meantime, you do your initial investigation. Uh, Aram, I want you to just give me a survival roll. Why aren't I skilled in survival? I screwed this up. Hang on. <laughs> because you're bad at building characters. Wait, I did screw. Wait, I'm, I'm changing that real quick here because there's no fucking way that a hunter ranger would not be skilled in survival. I have to have some capacity. What skills did you pick? You shut up. <laughs> I, hang on, wait, one second. Natural explorer, favorite enemy, right? Proficiencies, all this is smart. I did no, all the right didn't. things. Where are my abilities? It's under proficiencies, dipshit. <laughs> Investigation, nature, and perception. I did pick three ones, but I'm gonna cut the nature one and I'm instead gonna do survival. Did you take a background? Okay, good, because you yes, should I have did. two I did more. I'm a hermit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm a hermit. I, I got acrobatics, investigation, medicine, perception, religion, stealth, and survival. I'm good. 18 plus six is 24. Okay. So you notice, effectively, the thing I was kind of talking about with Neil. There is 
not blood at the scene of the, the murder, right? At, at the scene of the animal disappearance. Ah, not blood. No blood at scene of murder. Mm. Now, that is not an animalistic move, right? Like biting, ter- like any sort of animal kill, it's going to be immediate. But this kind of clocks to you as clever, right? Yes. The smell of blood watching something die will terrify the pack, which pollutes hunting grounds. You, my fine folk, are dealing with a werewolf. Just immediately, off the bat, it's like, clever hunter, werewolves. I've seen such a thing before. In fact, when you're looking around, like, the moment you get kind of like near the edges of the uh, of the farmland near the fences is where you tend to get like water mud collecting a little bit more and you can see these big sort of padded footsteps and it's hard to see because it's also in the process of climbing over a fence but this is definitely like big old mammal paw oh, look at the paws clearly this is an intelligent creature that came and killed all your livestock and led your farmers astray this is a thing that is smart to hunt, and I have seen them before. Fear not, gentle townsfolk. I am here to eliminate your werewolf problem. Immediately, people are grateful. You know, adventurers know what they're talking about. And like werewolf, they're immediately like looking between each other like, oh, this is, is one of us. You know, like, I always thought he was weird. He's probably a werewolf. Check yourself for bites and suspect everyone. You're a bad... uh, You're bad at this. Holy hell. Okay, cool. (laughs) So, now that the town is panicking... (laughs) Folks, this would be a very fun scene to run, is the entire town turning on itself and freaking out. Run this. I have about half an hour, 45 minutes. We gotta skip it. It's happening in the background. Just know that the town in s- itself hates everyone. Everyone is now <laughs> terrified of everyone else, and it's 100% a Rom's fault. Thank you. I thought this was a time where you would coast a little bit more, but you just you dove in real hard. Uh, after we have a full, like, the town turns on itself and everybody panics, what we get is the s- most xenophobic people in town basically the people who are the most ready to go like no 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 no. if it's a werewolf if there's somebody out there if they know we're hunting them they probably already we will come with you we'll defend our town we'll hunt these people you should arm yourselves and expect violence at the slightest turn (laughs) fucking christ (laughs) Aram. I love this character so much already You know what? Let's make this worse. Great. You came into town maybe a week after the last full moon. You spend another three weeks, basically, like another two and a half weeks in town, waiting for a full moon, convinced you're going after a werewolf. Absolutely. And I've done all the werewolf shit. Like there's wolves bane growing now on the outside of town. I convinced everyone to put it around their doors. Like the whole town has turned into an anti werewolf shield, basically. I've gone door to door and been like, turn over your silver. We need it. And we've melted down the whole town silver into pikes and arrows and other bullshit. There are now like People are searching carts that come into town, like standing there with these like silvered pikes. Just the town has gone off the fucking wall in like half a month. Neil, how does this look to you? <laughs> <laughs> I th- I th- initially, I think it, I observe it as some sort of holiday that I'm not aware of. That's the only <laughs> thing that, that could somewhat yeah. equate. Oh, they're the Fae, the Eladrin, they love festivals, so this is... It's their silver festival! They're, they're planting things, they're putting those things that grow around the home, so I, I take a step back because knowing that in a heightened sense that it's probably not an opportune time to do anything during whatever festival this happens to be. So it's again, foolish, but again, risk versus reward, it's not there. So I'm almost no interest. If anything, I probably go to another town and then 
kill someone else from there if possible. Yeah. While I'm waiting for this to right. die out. While we're all setting up, I'll just go murder some people over here. Yeah. Absolutely. Quick successful hunt. Get in, smash up a chicken coop, take some chickens, leave a transparent trail. Someone follows it come morning. Easy job. I want you to make me an arcana roll, Neil. Now, I'm fully aware that you're terrible at this, but let's find out. Real, real bad, because I definitely got a three on the die. You don't even make the connections like the Feywild. You probably have seen enough that you might have with a good roll. You might have clued into the werewolf connection. But all you know is you left. And when you came back, the town is on militaristic alert. Like they are armed, but they seem to be going against themselves. Basically, the Arcana check was for making the werewolf connection. You are yourself clever enough to realize that the town thinks one of them did it. They're blaming themselves for the people you killed. Displacer Beast should be able to feel hate. That would be cool. Right? Just have like an aura where they know like these two people, I don't I don't understand them. I don't speak their language, but I know they don't like each other. That would have been great in the other part of the podcast. Amateur. Um, Sorry. <laughs> hey, I can edit. <laughs> I'm leaving all this in. It is, like I said, near the beginning of the full moon where Aram, you finally decide Holly is going to gather up the team gets three of the most aggressive like we're going to say hunters um, but I think the more effective word here would be proto murderers mob I have gathered a mob yeah you grab three people isn't quite a mob but you grab some folks that are fully gang gang is a good word for it you grab a gang of people who think they're going out to find someone that they've lived next to for years with the intent to kill them Are you prepared to murder one of your own? Two of them are very uncomfortable with the question. They're just at that edge of morality where they know what the answer is supposed to be. I find them and I slide up to them and my beak clacks as they're standing because I've had them stand at attention, right? Are you sure you can kill one of your own? Because they will surely kill you. They will gut you, eat your entrails while you're still living. Behind you, You hear the answer of, they're not one of our own anymore if they've been killing our people. You shall help me on this particular investigation. You are now my lieutenant. Congratulations. He looks over, kind of gives the others a glance and just, we're going to do this. We need to do this or we're never going to be safe again. If we do not kill this creature tonight, it will plague you for the rest of your lives, may even turn you or your children into one of them. Let us go cease this once and for all. Here's what I'm going to ask, because this character is fucking arrogant. You know what you think you're looking for. So what I'm going to ask is the trail is trivial to find. Right. Do you investigate it? at all or do you find the trail and follow it no because in because i got people now right so i definitely investigate because i can show off in front of everyone Ah. so 100 percent. okay then give me the uh survival roll on the tracks that is going to be a 16 plus 6 is 22 then i want a secondary statement that is high enough to notice an important piece of information are you like self-aware enough to question your initial finding? That is a very good question. And the answer is going to be no, because I am definitely one of those people that will form a hypothesis and barrel forward. So the thing you mentioned, the thing that you see, the thing that's off compared to everything else is it's usually just inside the woods where the trail gets a little weird, where the animal has been kicking and then there's usually like a little bit of blood and it stops. So apparently this creature is taking a sheep, getting it into the woods and then killing it and then dragging it. But it's when you're looking at the paws that the numbers seem off. The steps are too closely packed together. 
if it was a werewolf walking on in two or four legs, they should be spaced further for the stride. So the way they're packed on top of each other, were it not you, you'd recognize that that means more legs. But being who you are, the only reasonable guess is either it treads over these paths multiple times, or maybe there are more of them. We are dealing with a very clever werewolf. Look how it walks back and forth across its own tracks to make it look like it is more than one individual. And immediately one of them questions, like, why, why would it do that? Like, it, it, I, I, like I, I don't mean to, I don't mean to step on, but like, they're all going in one direction. Like, that doesn't look because like it's stepping it over. Smart. Because it is clever. Because it knows. You would wonder, why are there so many marks? What direction are they going in? Oh, can we ever know? It knows. And it preys on that fear. It, it, he goes to like, make another comment. Your lieutenant big fucking meaty hand on the shoulder we should find out where it's going agreed follow me gentlemen Neil what's your normal prowl like I think slow. There's been nothing to give me reason to hunt any any faster than I need to. Nothing has ever come across. Not that I don't respect the idea that something could, because again, I came from a place where everything could have killed me. So the respect is still there. But as of yet, the concept of danger exists. But at the same time, like you're still flinchy. Yeah. You go camping in an area where you've been told there are bears. Like You know bears exist here, but nine times out of ten, you're kind of just walking. Usually stay to the trees just because the things that would walk are of no, or typically of no interest. So I would rather not deter any other wildlife from here because I don't want anything else to seem out of place as much as I can keep it that way. I want the forest to look like the forest that everyone has always known because I don't want there to be, I want there to be minimal clues that I exist. Aram, how do you follow this trail? Like, is this, is this a mob with, you know, you've mentioned like now they're, they're silver pikes. They're not pitchforks. Showing off the whole time. Okay, so this is not like a quiet, prowl of your own this is think of this as i am a boy scout leader on a nature walk fantastic showing off every single thing i find bragging about every single tuft of fur or whatever i find along the way that i assume is attached to the werewolf uh neil give me a perception check you can make it an advantage because the fact that the displacer piece doesn't have keen senses is clearly incorrect I got 16. You hear them coming. You hear a couple muffled voices, the occasional like deeper authoritative voices, but mostly a somewhat squawky, obnoxious voice (laughs) lecturing, almost elven. (laughs) This is a voice that reminds you of the Feywild in all of the worst ways. So uh, I think the first thing is I try and figure out which direction they're going. I want to move as little as possible, but also if I don't want to be. No, that's not true. I do want to be directly as close. You want to shift from being in front to alongside. Yep. And not move at all, if possible. Aram, are you making a perception check or is this going against your passive perception? As much as I'm an asshole and braggy, I'm also good at what I do, so I'm absolutely looking. Neil, I'm going to say that because of that level of focus, I'm going to give you advantage on a stealth check. Aram, you're making your perception roll. Because basically, you're watching the trail, right? You are terrestrial. My perception roll is a four plus six. I am too busy bragging. Yep. I got a 17. Fantastic. Then you can get above them pretty easily. You recognize two of them. 
you have a mind for faces. You you know who you've seen before. You have to keep track of these things. One of them was on a hunt and was one of the ones that returned to town. The other one, you remember having to wait for him to clear a path so that you could get further in, so that you could get to the sheep. Sort of uh, generate the hunt that you need. There's another one, a big one. You don't know this man. Unfamiliar. But what jumps out at you more than any of that is the bird. Rom, you haven't given us a, a physical description. Yeah, so much like most Kenkus, a uh, raven, basically, like a large humanoid raven. But the feathers are clipped. They are every single feather is clipped just a little bit. So it makes kind of a slash, almost like a point, right? Everything is so well preened and so well taken care of. In fact, when they break for a short rest and everyone else is cooking or bringing out sandwiches or making a little bit of coffee, I preen for a solid hour to make sure that every single feather is exactly in its right position. I am wearing a little bandolier. I've got arrows on my side and arrows ready on my chest. I have a long bow that is curved and beautifully carved, certainly elven. I've got a cloak on me that seems to be made almost of leaves. And when I sit down amongst the trees, I blend right in. And then I've got a pair of boots. And as we've been walking along and I've been lecturing these fine gentlemen about how they can be better hunters, I've shown off my boots that can mimic other people's tracks. And ever since I saw yours, those are the only tracks I've been leaving. You see that one, that one, I mean, Obviously, moments of observation, it speaks again. You correlated to the voice, but all of the elven make, you can see it. You remember the faces of the Eldrin. You remember them running with blink dogs. All the things that made the Feywild unappealing. Incarnated in this ridiculous little bird. So I think... You hit on the exact thing. I've seen the one twice. That doesn't work. Two times is, is too many to let a person go back. So I'm going to wait until the group has passed. And that's the one that I'm going to attack. So the way I'm going to run this one is basically I'll give you the multi attack. If you can kill this one in one go for stealth stuff until circumstances change, I'm not going to make you reroll. So like that 17 verse nine will hold. And then after someone dies, that's when we'll worry about, like, do we have to roll for stealth again? Or after you make yourself a parent, I suppose someone might not die. Seeing a person twice is something that I have never let go. Because if they come a third time, they're going to something is going to get figured out. The story is going to get too big. Every time they're out, they gain information and they can't learn enough to figure it out. So I'm going to wait until they stop because in, inevitably everyone stops. They they can only go for so long. They're not like me. So I wait until they stop. And that is the only person that I am focused on first because they need to go no matter what. If the other three get away, I can deal with it later. But that, that person can't live. What is that person named, Dylan? What are all my companions named? We're going to go with uh, Gunnar. Jeb and Chris. And which one is the one that our guest is focusing on? Uh, we're going to say Chris. Chris. Yeah, fuck Chris. <laughs> I mean, we're here to murder all four of you, so. But fuck Chris in particular. You're you're going after this Chris guy. Uh, what is your MO? Is this like, wait till they're alone on watch? Wait till they're uh, asleep. Someone else is on watch, but you can get Chris unconscious. I think there is that element of me because the reason the stories don't work is because I need to sow fear. If 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 there's too much time to think, it's going to mess things up. So I think as Chris is laying down to, to go to sleep, which means someone else is awake, that's when I take Chris. The Kenku's on watch. Oh, fine. I will take watch. And I have walked to the edge of the camp 
I've pulled out a rod, copper and brass rod that I have placed about 10 feet in the air, clicked a button, and it has remained. And I have climbed up onto my motionless perch, clawed my little bird feet around it, and I'm standing watch on my perfect platform. You're so fucking proud of yourself. God, you disgust me. You know, if, if someone else came up with that, you'd fucking no, it, love it, but it's me. It's pretty clever, but I have to play it up for the edit. Uh, <laughs> every time I'm mean to you, we get an extra patron. Just need some rough people stats. Uh, do a bandit. So here's the way I'm going to run this, Neil. The DC to notice you at this point, prowling this quiet in the dark, this low down to the ground, opposite end. It's going to be like a DC 30 to notice you. But every point of damage that you deal, I'm going to take off the DC for a rum to notice you after you kill this guy. That's cool. I like that. If you kill him perfectly, dealing exactly as many hit points as you must, it's going to be a DC 19. And if it takes that second hit and you go over, every bit of excess is going to make it easier for him to find you. So I'm just so I'm gonna make an attack. Yes. So yeah. you can you can come after this guy. You have advantage on the attack roll because he is currently in bed. Yep, Chris. Yes, Chris. He is currently laying down. He's the only one with a pillow. Everyone else has just brought like a bed roll, but Chris has actually packed like a little pillow, like kind of like 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 a little couch, you know, pillow, and has just laid his head down. Chris came out on that first hint because as a chicken farmer, the person who is getting all these excess feathers, it's how he got this pillow. He's sympathetic to the whole idea of the fucking fox in the hen coop. So when the first few ones came about, like when the first few people started disappearing and the animals were attacked, he was one of the people that was like, no, this is a problem. Yeah, I'll help you deal with this. Definitely at the maximum length possible, because one of the things is if Chris dies, Chris is definitely coming into the forest. 13 damage. That's two over. So we're going to have a DC 17, but you take this thing and it's like coming up. It's just over his chest. And it's almost like, I think we've all done this where you do the little flick on like a garden hose or something like that. And you watch the little pulse. It's that flick that travels up the tentacle so that that, that little pad flexes. The spikes come out and it's just up and down onto the chest, right over the sternum, right over the lungs. And those two-inch spikes drive into the chest. Immediately, can't quite breathe right, can't get the air, can't get the scream out. You want to make that perception roll? 18 plus 6 is 24. Then you hear the scrabbling. Like, there was just kind of a light thump just enough to kind of draw your attention, just enough of an impact, the sort of thing you could very easily brush off. But then it was the skittering noises as everything sort of is pulled aside as Chris is dragged into the wood. That's what gets you. And you wheel around and you see the last moment where he disappears into the bushes. I don't react. I don't raise alarm. Chris is dead. I can tell that. I watch where his body goes, and then I act. Okay. You watch it go into the bushes. Uh, Neil, up a tree, do you just make it, make sure he's dead and leave him for dead? What is? What are you doing with him now? So definitely make sure he's dead, step one, but then also immediate attention back to the other, back to the camp, because anything else... Like, we, it is the first moment in this story where we are of the same mind. Chris is dead. Chris doesn't matter. It's going to be a relatively low DC, but just give me a perception roll. Ten. You look in and you can see Bow Drawn, the bird, is watching in the bushes. Like it, It's on this little floating perch. Like you said, that, that common intent where Chris is dead he saw where Chris went and that bird is clearly waiting for signs of motion or something. It's watching you. It doesn't necessarily see you per se, but it is watching you. And then 
The other two are asleep. Let me give them a roll for it. Well, that's a two and a five. There are two unconscious men just close enough to like the embers of the fire. Like there is enough glow in the center of camp to make out shapes out in the bushes. If you don't have some form of dark vision, it is fucking nighttime. That recognition that for whatever reason, this creature also doesn't care that Chris is dead. That raises all kinds of internal alarms. And the other, again, now the other two, they also don't matter. It's all in and I am going to attack. This is the first and only time I have ever seen anyone react that way. And it's that is not good. You've seen enough to know that this is a hunter. If they don't die, they'll find you. This is a fight that is going to happen. Have it on your terms. Roll for initiative. That is a 14 uh, plus. Keep it, because I got a whole nine over here, so. That means Aram, you're going first. Displace your beast is in the bushes. You don't have clear line of sight. So what you're seeing there is you watched Chris dragged back. You saw enough to like, you watched the boots go. You saw the bushes shaking. And what you're waiting for there, for an unintelligent predator or for a, for a, a werewolf, honestly, in the full moon is usually going to be kind of feral. So you're waiting for like the extra signs of motion, the, the, the devouring of the prey or a sudden leap forward. And there is a long pause and Chris's kicks stop. And there is no motion in that bush. You don't see it. You can't possibly see it from this far away, but you know something is wrong. Okay, so Polly saw it go. It's not acting how Polly expected. So she's going to throw up a little barrier. She's going to get spike growth right where Chris just vanished. That is going to start mattering, Neil, when you start moving. While you're back there, while you're sort of low to the ground, you have to shift while there is suddenly these six inch spikes just growing out of vines. The roots are slowly pulling themselves to the surface and just jutting out suddenly. As it's happening around you, you can see the motion. You're just kind of shifting in the bushes around. You can see the motion. You know it's still there, but you have not taken harm from it. Anything else on your turn, Aram? I stay exactly where I am and I stay focused on that point. And I don't bother to wake up the other two. That just gives me an advantage to shoot. Every idea I had about why I should attack this creature is doubly confirmed from spellcasting and the level of resolve. Everything that is at this point, it is that creature and myself and there is no one else. Yeah, if a displacer beast likes to kill, wouldn't it also like to fight? Wouldn't it be like a little energized by this moment? Well, I, I think as, as long as I still think that it is most likely that I will win, I am, yeah, I am all on board. The displacer beast is a bully. Yeah. It's a bully. Yeah. And as long exactly. as it knows it has the power, it'll act. All right, then. What does it do? Uh, I want to get within... 10 feet and then the two immediately both tentacle attacks. He's got a bow out. You actually want to be within five feet of him. And he's dealt with elves. There's that moment when I start to head towards you that I, and I think the, the, creating those parallels between the two is the best part of this, is I look at the other two asleep and now I recognize them as tactical and nothing else. And so I will get within five feet and attack both of them, not you. You've got advantage on both those rolls to swing. Uh, you're also going to have to, because of spike growth, uh, you're going to take 2d4 damage because uh, Aram, you placed it at the edge. So it's just real, literally just going to affect him as he steps out of the out of the bushes. 
Okay, so I got 17 to hit on the first that's one. And we can say that that's a gunner, and then we will attack Jeb. Um, and 17 on that one as well. So I got 11 damage on the first hit. Dead. And 15 damage, because I rolled a 5 and a 6 on the second hit. Dead. No need to look at them. They barely move from where they sat. One of them, uh, Gunnar, the first one you hit, the, the, the worst hit, is there, like, gurgling as he just dies, and you stalk right up to this fucking bird. But like you said, I, I feel like there's that, that almost a hint of a whisper, like, stepping through, but is nothing of note, and both are dead, and now there's the the whole scene is eerie quiet because this is not the first time this forest has seen me kill. Aram, he came up within five feet of you, so you can fire? Yes, I can, because I have sharpshooter. Oh, you sneaky little bitch. You sat on that, too. Yep. <laughs> so I'm kind of waited for him to get within point blank range, and then I am going to take the negative five penalty to do plus ten damage as I fire. And I have two attacks, so I'm going to fire two arrows. That is going to be a 10 plus 9 is 19, minus 5 is 14. Okay, but you're still at disadvantage because you're attacking a displacer beast. Right, correct. So let me roll one more time. This is going to be a 10. It's the same, it's the, it's the same roll. A 10 plus 9 is 19, minus 4 is 14. Yeah, that's just a hit. Just barely a hit. So I have waited for this moment. I let three, I let two people die and I fire a shot. I'm gonna fire my second shot, which is a natural one. And the disadvantage is going to be a 19. So that's a natural one. No, you don't have disadvantage anymore because you hit him. And once oh, he takes damage. Just a natural one then. I fire this arrow into and I have pulled back super far. My arms are shaking by the time I let this arrow go. It sinks into you for a full eight points of damage. Plus four is 12, plus 10 is 22. As this silver tipped arrow, which is useless, <laughs> buries itself within you. There's there's a moment where like, once you recognize what you're dealing with, like you, you're you sighting down the length of the bow and you can see the glint of the silver and there's just a split second of fucker. There's a guttural cry of pain that is the amount of damage is beyond substantial <laughs> certainly more than i faced here i it probably doesn't outweigh some things that have happened before but nothing on this plane has ever damaged me in this way and i think at this point we're just we're squared off 10 feet 10 feet i'm totally within range and i did not expect that i thought i was safe so I got a 12 on the first hit, which I doubt that would hit. And I got a 12 on the second one. It doesn't hit me. You burned all your good rolls murdering civilians. <laughs> Neil, I want you to just once more, give me an arcana check. Okay, I got 16 on the die. You know what an immovable rod is. That thing operates on a button press. Would you be amenable to the idea that I could use my bonus action to do an offhand attack um, and, and do it right now? Yes. I mean, if the guy you're fighting says yes, then who am I to stand in the way? And of course, I saved the 18 on the die for a 24 just to make sure I can get that little button on the side. It's like a swing and one of them is just a miss. Like you get out of the way, another swing and you get the bow down and deflect. But as you're like spread wide, it's just the attack that missed. Same sort of thing where the pulse just runs up the tentacle and flicks it at the end. Aram, I want you to make a dexterity save. The DC is 10. It's basically nothing. I got a four plus six is 10. I just barely made it. I lost a couple feathers. I was going to give you the falling damage for falling 10 feet. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you just made it. So this is immediately your claws are in this thing and it just drops you are now standing on a stick that is in the air this is full wily e. coyote yeah and it is 
just barely that you manage to catch yourself on your feet five feet away from this thing's face. Bonus action, Hunter's Mark. Okay, so that's the start of your turn. And then I am going to take a... So so the displacement, reading it a little bit more, at the end of my turn, it resets. So I'm still displaced. So you'd still have disadvantage, whatever choice you want to make from this point. Right, so you're just you're just like popping everywhere, right? So I'm just going to pull an arrow and just like instantly fire. Like without even thinking, I'm just going to fire an arrow. So you've got disadvantage on this roll. Make the attack. That is going to be at plus nine. First roll is a 16, second roll is a natural 20. So that's gonna be a 16 plus nine. Another eight plus four is 12 points of damage. And I've got one more attack. Yep, still at disadvantage this time because close range, but yep, you can see this thing. Its jaws are basically at your throat. Have I ever seen anything like this? Give me a nature roll, I suppose. Plus zero. 18. Fucking kill it. There's a little bit of synthesis going on here. Like you've seen panthers and shit before. Like you've seen you've seen a cougar. The tentacles throw you off for a minute and you have to put together stories you've heard of things out of the Feywild. This was the sort of thing you didn't pay attention to those stories too much because, well, I don't have any intentions of going there anytime soon. I'll have time right, to like, gonna look into it. going to meet one of those creatures? It. Yeah. I can read up on it if I ever need to. The opportunity uh, never really presented itself. So now you are faced with this thing that you've heard tell of. You know what a displacer beast is. Right. I'm fighting something out of Mother Goose, right? Yeah. That's the effect here. I am literally fighting a fairy tale right now. You fighting this thing is equivalent, roughly, to me fighting a werewolf, where I would know what it is, and I would know, like, a couple of random facts from folklore. I would not know what is true. I would just know what was going on. And your brain would be fighting you the whole the whole time, going, this can't possibly be real. There's got to yeah. be another explanation. Yeah, absolutely. Then I would just, I mean, instantly, just, like, fire the one shot, fire the second shot, just, just emptying arrows into him. 14 plus 9 is 23, and 3 plus 9 is 12. So that one's going to miss. You made your shot. The displacer effect drops, and you were aiming explicitly in the wrong spot. Like, the first hit was almost a fluke. Like, you were going to shoot the illusory displacer beast in the head. And instead, you get dirt the moment that this thing drops. Yeah, I stay close. If anything, it's movement from side to side. I mean, just playing up that, playing up the displacement feel. And definitely the tentacles are reaching around and hitting and, you know, just full fury maw right in your face. But everything is happening from behind you. So the first hit... AC 16 is going to just hit me. Yeah, my AC is 16. Okay, so with the first tentacle hit, you will take 11 damage. The second hit is AC 18. Yeah, it's going to hit too. And that is a total of eight more damage. You just see a cascade of feathers and blood as I, as, as, as I lurch back and just caw to the heaven. I don't look good, but I'm still in the fight. I feel very much the same. <laughs> Just drop the bow, pull out a short sword. Lowest roll is a two plus nine is 11. That's a miss. Second attack. Lowest roll is a 12 plus nine is 21. That, that'll hit. Six plus four points of damage for ten points of damage as I Does rake your along your mark side. Go off in any way. So that's ten plus five, fifteen points of damage as I rake along your side with the sword. We are paralleled in meaningful ways, and I have found someone akin to me that I was never expecting. The funniest thing is, Aram, you changed my mind because I was ready to leave, but seeing that same look in your eye 
made me realize it was pointless. Because either this happens now or it happens again later. And if you've seen me now and you've dealt with me now, what are you going to bring to bear the second time? So I was fully, I was actually fully prepared to run away. Because you are clever enough to have made that note to have like, at this point, that silver arrow would have been the tip. The last thing where you were like, Wolf's Bane, silver arrows, he thinks he's hunting a werewolf. He is not ready. Yeah, you're not going to let it go. So a 18. The second one, I rolled a 20 on the die. Roll the first damage. That's 2d6 plus 4. 12 on the die, which means I rolled two sixes on 2d6. So that's 16 16 points of damage. damage. I happen to know how many hit points Aram has. And I happen to know that your next roll is going to be 4d6 plus 4, which means that Aram can survive if and only if you roll all ones odds of one in 1296 out of the uh 1295 other options i went with a five a six a two and a five. Oh, this is an evisceration for a total of 22 damage on the critical hit the first swing comes around and it's almost like a punch. It just coils back. You rear up as if you're going to claw at him. And when he brings the sword up to guard against your claws, that tentacle just juts forward and hits them in the gut. As he bends over, the other tentacle pulls back and just fires forward and we do a hard cut. Neil, where do you bring the bodies? I pay a lot of respect to the Kinku body because of what's happened. The other three, eat them up, do everything I would normally do. I leave hints. I try and sow fear, I, which thankfully, thank, thank you, Aram, for sowing far more than I personally ever could have because I can't communicate with this town. So, like you said, knowing the wolfsbane, the silvered arrows, I I play into that with the other three. But they never find a hint of the kinku. I take that back and I guard that. And Not like a I said, single feather. Yeah, no. I there is there is a reverence because of what has happened. I, I don't know if I could go so far as to like have something adorned from it, but if if I figure that out than I would. But yeah, the other three play it up. Let let it be as werewolf as I can manage. But the Kinku is no, no one ever sees a hint. Deep, deep in the woods, there is a cave. Off to the side of it, there are wolves that have learned their place by trial and error on their part that are feasting on old, half-rotted sheep's carcasses. Things that weren't enough for food. They were, you took them to draw attention, and that was it. Deeper in the cave is where the man bones are. Left around, food, chewed, left off to the side, cracked open for the marrow. Deep in the back, as you rest, waiting for the next hunt, there is almost like a stone that juts out a little bit on the wall as clean as you could take it down sits a Kenku's skull held aloft by an immovable rod (laughs) (laughs) yes thank you for joining us for the displacer beast for more information about us notes for each episode and ways you can help support the show head over to killeverymonster.com if any of the ideas we've discussed on the show have sparked some of your own tell us about it on twitter at kem podcast You'll find me at DJ Malenfant and Aram at Aram Vardian. For ad-free episodes, early releases, bonus episodes, print-ready maps, our new audio DMs notes, and my character sheets for each encounter, head over to patreon.com slash deadghostpro. Our intro theme and many of the sound effects you hear in the show were created by Battle Bards. Check them out at battlebards.com. This episode was produced by Aram Vartian and Dylan Malenfant. I also did the editing. 
we were joined by Neil Powell. You can find him on Twitter at Jote Moniak. And if you are anything like me and all of that information just fell right out of your head, you'll find everything you need at killeverymonster.com. And we'll see you next time for, for Kill, Kill Every, Every Monster. Monster.